and for the presentation. So, yes, I will talk about recent, um, well, some uh, not so recent work with uh, June Ho a couple of years ago, and then some recent work with Jonathan Leake. And this, uh, well, we can, one can present this in different ways, but one way of doing it is via the POTS model, and uh, that I thought would be suitable for this workshop. So, <clears throat> so first, yeah, as I told you, this is based on joint work with these two, June and Jonathan. So we start by, by talking about the mathematical physics background to our problems. So, and this is the POTS model. So we have a <clears throat> finite and undirected graph, but we allow for loops. And then one can define the partition function of the Q-state POTS model by this form. So, so here this, so we have two param well, we have a parameter Q, and we raise that to the power K of A, where K of A is the number of connected components of the subgraph with the edges A. So this is a sum over all subsets of the ground set E. And then we have variables for each edge to T E. And uh, well, so the, when uh, when Q is an when Q is a, an integer, namely two, this is the uh, Ising model. And uh, when Q is a positive integer, this will also makes sense for in in statistical physics. <clears throat> so we well, so we we may then from this partition function, we this defines a probability distributions on the subsets of E. And again, if Q is a positive integer, this is the a Gibbs measure, one can think of. So one can define it by, well, if X is a random subset of E, the probability of seeing a, a set A is just given by, by this. And then we have to normalize by the partition function. And this, um, this is uh, sometimes called the Photon Castellane random cluster model, or just the random cluster model. Okay, so feel free to to interrupt me at any time, or, or if uh, something I said doesn't make sense, and I see that Alan wants to say something. Just there's a, there's a typo. The two products should be E and A. The two product. Ah, sorry. I see that. That's very observant. Thanks. Now it makes sense. Otherwise, it would, that would factor through. Thanks. Thank you very much. OK, so I hope you did, I didn't confuse you too much. So and actually, one can also, well, this. Uh, this uh, vari variable TE can can also be uh, uh, well negative but not too negative it could be larger than negative one but for our purposes it will be positive well non-negative <clears throat> okay and one expert of this is in the audience alan sokal who studied this from both a, a statistical physics point of view but also from a combinatorial point of view and has and if you're interested in it you should consult his i think two survey papers about it where you can find find out more. Okay, so then uh, we have this um, Gibbs measure or the this um, uh, probability measure given by here, and then I can think about uh, positive and negative dependence. So positive neg positive dependence is a sort of a name for for properties that model attracting particles, when particles want to attract each other, and negative dependence is the, then the opposite than when when we have repelling particles instead. So <clears throat> for Q greater or equal to one, which is most, which is of course the most studied because it has the physics interpretation, then the POTS model 
is easily seen to be positively dependent. And this is because we have this FKG theorem that is a powerful tool that lets us sort of, uh, deduce that immediately. But we're not going to talk about Q in, Q in that regime, but, but we will talk about Q in <clears throat> between 0 and 1. And for Q between 0 and 1, much less is known, and most of it is conjectured. So, yeah. So, for example, one important negative dependence properties property is negative correlations. And negative correlations just says that the probability of seeing two particles present is less than or equal to what it would be if, if these events were independent. Then it would be a product, right? Uh, so we have some negative dependence going on, so therefore we should have inequality here. So the, the probability of seeing both i and j should be less than or equal to the pro product of the individual probabilities. So this is a naive and, you know, um, now, even simple negative dependence property. But even that is, is unknown. And this has been a, uh, an open problem for very long, almost folklore, but it's mentioned by Pimentel, Jeff Kahn, and Grimmett, and others. And it's, yeah, so the POTS model should be negatively correlated for Q between zero and one. So if you have nothing to do, you can do try to solve that. And uh, it is it is known for an important special special case, <clears throat> already by Burkhoff, who, know, who may, maybe didn't know this uh, interpretation of it, but he could prove that this random spanning tree measure, so just that we, we look at the spanning trees of our graph and then give equal probability all to all of these spanning trees. So this is a probability measure and it's and it's a certain limit when we let Q go to zero. And it turns out that this is uh, negatively correlated. <clears throat> and for, for, for this case, one can also prove a stronger statement called negative association, but we won't talk about that. But this, uh, this conjecture about negative correlation is unknown even for the random forest measure. So, so we look at all the random, well, all the forests, so where we don't have subsets, where we don't don't have a cycle, and put equal probability to them, and then we we ask if this is negatively correlated, and this is unknown too. So there's a lot of open questions, but we shall see that we can maybe say something about negative dependence anyhow. So another property that is desirable is something sometime, sometimes called the ultra log concavity or the Newton inequalities. So now we look at the rank sequence. So RK, this is just the probability of, uh, of your set being of size K. And uh, this ultra log concavity says that this satisfies satisfies this inequality, and it looks like some some kind of negative dependence property. And it is a quite desirable negative dependence properties if you want to look at sort of uh, infinite limits of stuff. <clears throat> so what we could prove was actually then that. For Q, Q between 0 and 1, the POTS model is ultra log on K. And this is, I guess, the first non trivial fact that, that could be proved for, for, for any graph about negative dependence uh, and for any Q between 0 and 1. <clears throat> and also, we could almost prove uh, negative correlations. But we have this annoying two there, which sort of is undesired, which we don't want there, of course. But it is there. <clears throat> and the proofs of these facts uh, use Lorentzian polynomials, which we shall 
defined in a while. But first, we want to see that this uh, box model can also, well, 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 okay. I don't want to get to that first. But first, we want to look at this Photoan Castellain representation, <clears throat> which is a which holds then for positive integers q. We can then represent the, this uh, uh, this uh, partition function in a very neat way. And this then is, well, uh, I guess the original form of the partition function because this says that it is sort of the, the partition function of the POPs model because we can think of these as spins and with a change of variables here, we, one can see then that <clears throat> this is actually the, the real partition function of the POPs model. But uh, so, yeah, so, so 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 this is a sum over over all functions from the vertex set to the first Q oh. integers, positive I integers. The screen. And then the this product here um, is then over uh, yeah. all the over edges. Five o'clock. And then we have this uh, chronicle delta here, which is one if these are equal and zero. So what in particular then, if we set all these TEs to be negative one, then this is uh, then this is equal to zero if 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 um, well th this is this is is zero. So it's zero whenever a an edge is is uh, monochromatic. So this a uh, yeah if we put T equals negative one, then this is zero. So we, we're not allowed to have any edge, well, which is monochromatic. <clears throat> so so in particular, then if if uh, if we set all the TEs equal to negative one, then we get the chromatic polynomial. So we just count the these sigmas which are proper colors. Okay, and this leads us to Sort of another log concavity conjecture, which, uh, well, in different strengths, is given by different uh, mathematicians. And the conjecture is that the, these, if we collect, uh, if we if we write the chromatic polynomial in in its Taylor coefficients, then uh, these uh, coefficients form a log concave sequence. <clears throat> And it should be said that yeah, this in this regime when Q when the Ts are equal to negative one, it, it also makes sense it, as a, in statistical physics, and it's a part of the anti-ferromagnetic regime. And this was proved spectacularly by Junha in 2012 using a uh, Hodge theory or algebraic geometry. So, which was maybe surprising, but but it could also be seen as sort of a continuation of of uh, Richard Stanley's proof of the uh, G, G theorem that also used Hodge theory in one sense. Okay, but To, to go further then, we want to see, well, all of this that I've been talking about now can be generalized, generalized to the generality of matroids. And uh, there are different ways of defining a matroid. And we'll be doing it by looking at the rank function. So the rank function is um, just a, a function from the power set of E to the natural numbers. And it should satisfy three properties. The first property is, is that it sh the rank should be less than or equal to the cardinality. It should be monotone. And most importantly, it should be submodular. So we should have the submodular inequality. 
And of course, the motivating example is when you, when we're given <clears throat> m vectors in some linear space, then we get a, a rank function of a matroid by just looking at the the dimension of the span of the of the vectors indexed by s. And then it's easy to see that this is of course uh, monotone and it's the uh, well it's the uh, Upper bounded by by the cardinality and the submodularity follows from the modular law, and we call them a linear matroid. And we also get graphic matroids, so then corresponds to to this uh, this where we, where we look at the size of the vertex sets minus the number of connected components again. And we want to talk about the lattice of flats of a matroid too. So a subset of E is a flat if whenever you add something from outside of, of your set E, uh, your set F, you, you increase the rank. So it's maximal with respect to the number of yeah, the, the, the number of vertices in, in it. So whenever you add a new vertex, then you you, um, you increase in rank. And this turns out to be a, a lattice so that the greatest the lower bound and the, uh, and the least upper bound always exists. So, and we denote this by L of M, the lattice of flats of the matrix. And again, if we have this motivating example with the vectors in a linear space, then <clears throat> One can look at the, the collection of all the subspaces of Kn spanned by these vectors or subsets of these vectors. And then we have this one-to-one -one correspondence between, between uh, these subspaces and the lattice of, the lattice of flats. So, it's, um, so in the motivating examples, this lattice of flats is just the lattice of subspaces. So, it's, uh, so this is what one should think of. And we also have this Mervius function, right? Which um, is zero unless f is smaller than g. And with smaller than g, we just, this is just set containment. f is contained in g or equal to g. And it's equal to one on the diagonal, and it's uh, if f is less than g, it should satisfy this. So we can recursively define the Mervis function in this. <clears throat> and then the characteristic polynomial is just, well, essentially one, a, a, a generating polynomial, not really, but, but it sort of, we collect all the Mervis numbers here and collect them in a polynomial. And it's called the characteristic polynomial. And indeed, um, uh, if we have a graphic matroid, then the, the chromatic, the characteristic polynomial is the chromatic polynomial. Right. And the version of this, uh, the log concavity of the chromatic polynomial then goes also was conjectured for for the um, matroid version for the for the characteristic polynomial, and uh, so this says that indeed the, these coefficients form a log concave sequence, the Whitney numbers that they are called. And this was recently proved by Adi Prasito and Katz. Also, then they had to develop a well, they developed Hodge theory for matroids, even when the matroids aren't representable. So before her and her and cats could could do this, when uh, the ma the matroid was representable over some field, <clears throat> but uh, at the proceed to her and cats were able to get rid of the dependence of the field and could do it in full generality. And what we'll do. Well, try to do now is a sketch a short and self-contained polynomial proof 
of this using Lorentzian polynomials on cores. And this is joint with Jonathan Leak. So if I pause here, maybe there, if, if there's any questions. Sorry, as I said yesterday, you can just unmute yourself and ask a question, or if you prefer, you can put it in the chat and I will read it out loud. OK, so this is the, I guess, combinatorial background, and now we will define this Lorentzian polynomials on cones. <clears throat> so first, some notation. This is just the directional, we denote by dw, the directional derivative with respect to w. And now we want to look at some homogeneous degree d polynomial with real coefficients. And we want to look at some uh, open convex cone in Rn. And we call F C Lorentzian if whenever we pick D vectors in our cone, this uh, sort of, <clears throat> if we di differentiate D times, since the degree is D, we will just get a number, and this number should be positive. This is the first coefficient, the, the first property. So it's a positivity <clears throat> condition. And the other condition is more of a log concavity condition. So it says that, and it's, I have AF here, and it, that stands for Alexander of Alexander of Fenkel. So if you if you want to think of uh, if you know about Minkowski polynomials and convex bodies, there's there's this Alexander Fenkel inequalities, and and this is exactly what this is here. So it's some um, log concavity statement, which is sort of like the Alexander Fenkel inequalities. And these coefficients then is sort of like the mixed mixed volumes then, which are non-negative in general. <clears throat> but then you know, but if it's full dimensional, uh, if if the bodies are full dimensional, then they they are positive. Okay, and one can also formulate this last this second condition equivalently with an L here standing for Lorentzian that the quadratic polynomial obtained by differentiating d minus two times along vectors in C has exactly one positive eigenvalue. So this is then, the, it, in other words, it has the Lorentzian signature. So this is, then. so this quadratic has the Lorentzian signature plus, well, generically it has plus, minus, 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 minus. So this is the, the definition, and we then see, look at some examples of this. Okay, first, <clears throat> we, so we first define, define this notion um, for the positive orthant, together with Jun He, and then we call this uh, Lorentzian, but in general then, we call them C Lorentzian. So, but we then, for if I talk about Lorentzian polynomial, I will, uh, I, we will think of the the cone will be the positive orthant. So, some fundamental properties of C Lorentzian polynomials are that it's closed undertaking products. which is not entirely obvious, right? It is, uh, well, this is more obvious that it's closed under taking derivatives with respect to the, the cone. So if you have a, a, a direction which is in the, the closure of the cone, then if you, and, and take the derivative, then you're <clears throat> gonna be Lorentzian again or identically zero. And more importantly for our purposes today, 
is that you can deduce log concavity statements from it. So if we if we now look at some, if we restrict our polynomials to to a line, well, between, well, to a plane, I guess, uh, <clears throat> then um, well, where u and v are in the closure of a cone, and we collect the coefficients, then the, these coefficients will be ultra log concave, meaning that this sequence AK is log concave. And this is sort of our plan in trying to prove this. Here on Rota Welsh conjecture, we want to cook up some Lorentzian polynomial and some U and V, and then and, and then combinatorially see that this is collect the coefficients and see that these are the Whitney numbers. <clears throat> One more examples. The determinant is going to be Lorentzian on the cone of positive definite definite matrices. And the reason for this is that the determinant is a hyperbolic polynomial. So more if you know what a hyperbolic polynomial is, then, then uh, all hyperbolic polynomials are Lorentzian with respect to the to the hyperbolicity cone. So then Lorentzian polynomials are can be seen as a generalization of hyperbolic polynomials. And then as a we talked about the Alexander Fenkel inequalities, and this is one of the motivating properties too, that and it turns out that volume polynomials of convex bodies are always Lorentzian. And so are volume polynomials of projective varieties, if that tells you something. <clears throat> and Various of polynomials associated to matrix turn out to be Lorentzian too. Okay, so these were some examples, and now we want to talk about. So we want to. As the plan was to to find some multivariate polynomial associated to matrix, and uh, then they should be which should be C Lorentzian with respect to some cone. And the cone that that comes into play here is the cone of submodular functions. So, and this is also very crucial in the Hodge theory for matrices, where this submodular functions is the, the Neff cone, so called. <clears throat> and what we do is we look at pairs of of um, pairs pairs of flats that are comparable. So K is less than L in the lattice of flats. And then we look at the sort of Euclidean space. So, so this is our Euclidean space where the polynomial lives. And it's indexed by just uh, the, the sets that lie strictly in between K and L. This is our Euclidean space. And then we can look at the submodular functions inside this Euclidean space. So we look at all the strictly submodular functions. So this consists of all, all the members of our Euclidean space for which the submodular law holds strictly. And it should hold strictly, so therefore we can only uh, have, well, they should hold for incomparable S and T. And here we set yk and yl to be zero, since we, we don't consider s, s is not allowed to be k or n. <clears throat> so these are the boundary conditions. So this is our cone that, that we want to consider. And we want to consider it for all um, or intervals in the, the lattice of flats. So all pairs of comparable k and l. And this is not a, a non-empty cone, it's an open cone, a non-empty open cone because we have this inside it, for example. One can check that this is always <clears throat> strictly submodular. So now comes the crucial definition of the polynomials that we're looking at. <clears throat> so I say that there, so we want to compare different intervals. So if we have an in interval KL and a smaller interval MN inside there, 
then I claim that there's a canonic canonical projection from the Euclidean space of the interval KL to the Euclidean space indexed by MN. And it's not really important what it is for our purposes today, but here it is. But you sh shouldn't remember it. But it does the job. And it does the job in, in the sense that it maps the submodular cone into the submodular cone. So we have this map that takes, we have this larger interval and it maps it to the low, so to the smaller interval, and it's a projection. And now we can define our polynomials. <clears throat> and this is a well definition and theorem because it's not clear that these polynomials exist per, per se, but it's not too hard to prove that they are unique and exist. So we have then a matroid M, <clears throat> and I. I claim that there is a unique family of polynomials, which we call Paul KL, for each interval in the lattice of lats, with the following properties. So the first property is that it's a polynomial in the variables TF, where F is, sits strictly between K and L. Okay. And the other property is that if if L L covers K. So th this means that the rank of L is the rank of K plus one. So we have this case then in the Hasse diagram. Then we require our polynomial to be just equal to one. So is, this is not too bad so far, but then the crucial crucial property is that <clears throat> when we when we take the derivative of the polynomial, then we get a product of polynomials of the same type with projected variables. And this is sort of the crucial property. So if we have K here, L here, and F here, and we wanna we wanna look at the polynomial of KL, then if we take the derivative with with, with respect to TF. Then we get a product of these two guys. So this is a very well neat defining property of the polynomials. <clears throat> and to see that they define at least the, the polynomials, we can look at if you're familiar with Euler's formula for homo homogeneous functions, well, it, well in general it just says that if you have a polynomial homogeneous polynomial of degree D, then D times F is just the sum of the very sum of the variables times the this is Euler's formula. And if we look at and if we do this for the polynomial itself, then yeah, we've done this is just Euler's formula. But then <clears throat> we can use this defining relation. So this is then <clears throat> on the right hand side, we have a product of polynomials for smaller intervals. So this defines the polynomial uniquely by recursion, by, by, by induction. Well, this proves the uniqueness and it, and it also allows us to compute the polynomial recursively. So if, if DKL is equal to one, so this is the case. So DK, I didn't say what that is, but it's just the difference of ranks minus one. So if DKL is one, then our lattice of flats looks like this. And we have some F here maybe, and L here. <clears throat> and then the polynomial is just the, the sum of all the Fs that are, that are in the middle here. So then it's very simple. And and why? Well, if we we, we just apply this for for uh, for f k the polynomial is one, and for l f it's one. So we have one here and one here. So we just have the t f there. So we can compute it when the d d is one and we can also compute it when d is two. But th this takes a little more work, 
but here it is. <clears throat> so to understand this form formula, we have say K here and L here, and then we have two layers in the middle. And we denote these here by F and these by G. And then uh, what this says is that we sum over all chains saturated chains or maximal chains and uh, we get this uh, factor here and if you do the your math right you can actually write this as a, as a square minus the sum of squares so this is a quadratic and this says that it has the Lorentzian signature right you can read up the signature here plus plus and then a lot of minuses And very sketchy, but from this follows that if if the degree is two, then your the polynomial is SKL Lorentzian. That I but what follows from this is is that it has so, uh, Peter, there is a question in the chat. Yes. I can't so, see oh, actually um so uh, Deb Bischel is asking, are you using that this process depends on a lattice consisting of flats of a metroid? Can this be done on more general lattices? Yes, a very good question. And yes, this can be done on, on well, on sub lattices of the, well, lattices, sub lattices of the Boolean lattice, I guess. And uh, but but in order for it to be Lorentzian, then it you know that's another question. So but the construction works for other lattices too, absolutely. But one has to be a little careful about uh, <clears throat> somebody's doing construction work in my building, but maybe you don't hear, hear it. No. Okay. But anyhow, so so then we can prove that if uh, the degree is two, then the polynomial is Lorentzian. And our main theorem is then uh, that uh, this polynomial is always Lorentzian for any interval k. And the the sketch of proof proof is by induction over of a d when and we've just indicated how we prove it for, for the d less than or equal to 2. And then the proof uses this, uh, this defining identity. And recall that the, the prod, that uh, this Lorentzian property is closed undertaking products. And these uh, projections had the right property that it maps the, the submodular cones to the submodular cones. So we get for free that this uh, <clears throat> right hand side is always Lorentzian. And then we can prove sort of a general theorem that um, that if we have this property that all the derivatives are Lorentzian and we have this sort of the, the ground, uh, well, and, and the degree is larger than two and we have some regularity uh, conditions on the uh, on the support of the polynomial, then it, it is always true that 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 it is Lorentzian. So so this sort of well, so I'm hiding sort of a general theorem here, but we won't get into this. But this is sort of the gist of it. And how do we do? How do we then prove the heron rotter welsh conjecture? Well, <clears throat> we consider two distinguished elements of the uh, in the closure of this submodular cone, namely. Of course, if you just have the, the cardinality of S, then this is a modular element. But you see, we, we, we're not considering, we, yeah, we're not considering um, the endpoints. So, so if, if the endpoints are involved, we get something which is strictly positive. So, so, so this is modular whenever you're not concerning the end part, the, uh, the empty set in E, but otherwise it's yeah, and otherwise it's positive. And the same for this beta. 
And what one can then prove is exactly what I indicated before that if we look at the if we look at this polynomial and uh, you know, look at this just re restricted to alpha and beta and collect the coefficients, then it turns out that these are actually the absolute value of the kth coefficients of the reduced characteristic polynomial. And then the polynomial, uh, the proof follows. And and what makes and this is just since since our polynomials are recursively defined, it's just a, like a three-line proof to prove this almost by, or maybe not half a page, by using Weissness theorem, if you know what that is. Once you have this, that, that this polynomial is Lorentz. <clears throat> okay, so how did we come up with these polynomials? Okay. So we came up with these polynomials, I guess, from so we wanted to have a fully polynomial proof of the the, the proof of adversity to Hohen cats, and to do that we we so so they have sort of a recursive structure in their paper too, but we want wanted to see how it works just on polynomials, and this is how sort of the this recursion came out, and then one has to figure out what the the right notion of Lorentzianness is, but anyhow, so the the, the charring of a matroid was introduced by Feichner and Yushvinsky in 2004, and then studied more in detail by Adebrecht and Hohn Katz, who then proved the so-called Hodge-Riemann relations for the charring. And the Hodge-Riemann relation says something about the signature of certain uh, Hessians or matrices. And this is seen to then imply the Hero Rota Welsh conjecture. And indeed, this theorem that our main theorem can then be, be rephrased as well, first, well, what we can prove, we prove that this polynomial is indeed the volume polynomial of the Chow ring of the matroid. And then, okay, and the main theorem translates as. Than the Hodge Riemann relations of degree one for AFL. And I guess my time is almost up, right? Is it? So, uh, no, I don't think so. We started, I think, uh, well, let's see. So you have 10 more minutes, so eight to be more precise. Okay. Then I was faster than I thought. But, but then, yeah, I want to. So then I can tell you about what, what I skipped, more details about how, how this um, sort of what, <clears throat> yeah, what, what, what was skipped in this proof and for the machinery that makes it work. So we call, we borrowed this from, from Hodge theory that, so, so if we have a, a open convex cone in Rn, well, then the linearity space is, is the largest <clears throat> linear space in, the, in its closure. And in other words, it's the intersection of the closure of the cone and it's negative. And then we say that C is effective if sort of we can, if for any point in the, in the cone, we can add something in the linearity space so that it points in the positive orthant. So one motivating example is maybe the upper half plane. Oh, no, sorry. The, the, the positive, this. Ah. No, sorry. But anyhow, the, so the defining relation is that if, if you have it's effective if you can always add something in the lin for any vector you can add something in the linearity space to it so that it points in the positive orthon. So if you quote sort of by this linear, the, this uh, quote out this linear space, then it sort of sits inside the positive orthon. And then it's more or less a folklore theorem that says that this uh, this um, 
strictly submodular functions, this cone of strictly submodular function is indeed effective, and its linearity space is the set of modular functions. So then uh, we want to define this. What? So, <clears throat> so then um, we have this theorem that says so. So first um, we call a matrix A whose off-diagonal elements are non-negative. So we don't care about what it is on the diagonal, but the off-diagonal element should be non-negative. And this is called irreducible if. Uh, for each distinct i and j, we can always find a path along which the matrix is uh, positive. So we can go from i to j along entries which are positive. So this has to do with the Perron Frobenius theorem. <clears throat> so then one can prove this that, so the engine that makes it work, sort of that we can prove things by induction is the following. So, so if we have some polynomial, uh, some uh, homogeneous polynomial of degree at least three, and we have some cone that is effective, meaning that, yeah, in the sense of the previous slide, then, then we can do that F is C Lorentzian if the following condition is hold. So the first is that it should, the polynomial itself, should be invariant under the, this lineality set. So the lineality space of the polynomial should be uh, a superset of, of this lineality space of the cone. And the other property is one that is, is in the definition of C. Lorentzian, so we should have this positivity of the, the, the mixed derivatives. And then the the, the third property is that uh, the Hessian, when you differentiate d minus two times, then the Hessian of that is always irreducible and it's off diagonal entries on a negative. And this should hold for any, uh, any tuple, for any uh, d minus two uh, vectors in the code. So this third property is just some some non-degeneracy non, non -degeneracy, uh, condition, and this is a positivity con positivity condition, and this is a condition then that is <clears throat> uh, yeah that has to do with this that the, the cone is, is is properly defined. So. And the, the then the crucial if, if all of these are are satisfied and these are always are, are usually easy to to verify but then the crucial property property that makes it work is that well then if the derivatives also are Lorentzian then then we can deduce that f itself is Lorentzian and this is sort of what makes everything work but now I think I should stop I guess thank you So, um, first of all, uh, there is a question in the chat that somehow I didn't notice uh, and was done towards the beginning of your talk. So, Roberto Conti was asking, is there some sort of physical interpretation of this conjecture? And uh, so now which I don't know exactly which conjecture uh, Roberto had in mind, but. So maybe I think probably this one. Uh, that it was a conjecture by Rota and, and two other guys. Okay. About yeah, uh, probably close to this. Yes, here. So yeah. ooh, is there? So so I think I don't have the intuition for for the physical inter interpretation, but maybe Alan has. I don't. Know. I don't know. So this is something about the ant anti-ferromagnetic uh, regime, but I don't. 
That is, of course, a, 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 a negative dependence property. So are you, are you R1, do you want to see negative dependence or repelling in that regime? I don't know. Isn't this related to the story of where the zeros are located? It is too, right? If it if if we would have a rerouted if all the polynomials were real, then uh, we would have log concavity, and this is the true for the mag for for some graphs, but not for a, well, well for the complete graph at least. But, but of course, um, yes. But yeah. So there are certain conditions that one can, when one can deduce that the coefficients are log concave on on the zero sets. But this this is more like if 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 there are, are in a in a in a cone like like this or a sector. But no. But other, otherwise, I don't know if there is some physics interpretation of it. Are there uh, other questions or comments? So maybe a related question is, um, does your work suggest a POTS model for arbitrary matroids and not just graphs? Yes, I know already Alan Soko considered that. Although, you know, Okay, but 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 the physics interpretation. Then I think at least you need uh, uh, representable matroids. Then you can sort of define something. Uh, well, you can get some POTS model, I think. Yeah, you can define for an arbitrary matroid. You can define the analog of this fortune Castellan thing, but whether it has a counting interpretation is quite subtle. For some matroids, it has a counting interpretation only for certain integers Q, not all. Yeah. It's a little bit strange. So then it becomes a quasi. Are there uh, other questions? Maybe Are a there, similar. Uh, other, oh. Maybe, sorry, a similar question in fashion if the core part of your talk when you have explained us the proof by Lorentzian polynomials and so on. If the construction that you do is more clear to understand when the matroid is graphical and you can really understand what these intervals are and these maximal chains are on graphical matroids. Um. Well, I, I don't know if it, I think the abs, abstract the abstractions is m maybe makes it easier to see what's going on because when you look at the okay when you look at the graph the, the lattice is corresponding to the graphical I, I I think it's just going to be a little messy I think it's clean in the in this abstract way but maybe one can riff you know, if, if we have some specific lattice, then maybe we can prove something stronger or something more refined. That is possible. But, yeah. So uh, there is another question that uh, in the chat, uh, Barry Gallendorpalen, if I pronounce correctly, is asking, uh, do you have an idea of what Paul sub empty set to the L, so from the empty set to L, might look like for order ideals in the lattice of flats, maybe thinking of them as unions of lower intervals. I, uh, so I don't really understand the question, so. so I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I can Go try ahead. and ask again. I mean, so I don't really, I don't fully understand how these poll work, these polynomials work as projections. Mm -hmm. I was just sort of curious how much requires 
we're thinking of them on intervals. And I was wondering how much requires just the interval or could you do something like summing together these polynomials and then somehow, okay. So the way I think about this is I think sometimes about um, order ideals of the lattice of flats and the geometric interpretation of some of these order ideals. And I'm wondering if there's a natural way to define these polynomials on those kinds of order ideals and then write down the characteristic polynomial like thing mm -hmm. of these instead of looking at the characteristic polynomial of the interval. There could be, yeah. Uh, so maybe, maybe if, if one has defined the polynomial for for intervals and then one could use this um, Euler's formula to define it for 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 order ideals too, but I don't know if it's going to be uh, a correct definition or I, I don't have any intuition for if it will work or if it has the desired properties, but yeah. There, but but uh, I should say that these uh, the constructions that we have are quite flexible. So, so I think uh, the ideas that are used could certainly be used on other more general problem, problems too. It's just, you know, to, uh, we have to, one has to tweak some parameters and, uh, you know, as we always do in mathematics. But we, we tried to make it as, as um, compact as possible. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Peter, so I have one question. So June Hu um, proved a whole bunch of amazing log concavity results. Um, and one of them was for the counts of the independent sets of the matroid. Is that right? Yes, and then uh, June and I, uh, we, 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 we we're able to prove the strongest of these Mason's conjecture um, that uh, that they are ultra log concave even. And it, it, how does that proof go? Did, does that yeah. involve polynomials like this, or is it totally yes. different? Yeah. So the proof of that is actually more in spirit of. Uh, so what we proved is actually that that this Potts model is Lorentzian itself. So if we well, it, the, the partition function. So, so if we, if for a matroid too. So, so if we add a new variable here, say, s. Oops, sorry. Uh, so if if this is now a pa parameter uh, between zero and one, and then we normalize this y to the n minus a, then right. Yeah. So, so this becomes a, a so now this becomes a, a homogeneous polynomial, and and we prove that this is Lorentzian, and then it then so so yeah so this is sort of the proof of 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 this um, yeah so this is how 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 we prove this ultra log concavity. So so the independence numbers are are, are are covered by this in when we let cube go to zero in, in a certain regime. Right? Yeah, that's really beautiful. So you have you really have a, a unified way of looking at all of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've got a question. Uh, uh, so, uh, so instead of having uh, the W sub i's as real numbers, if, if you consider them to be uh, polynomials with, with non-negative coefficients, uh, so, so can, uh, uh, do, do you have some way of, uh, uh, so, so, so maybe, maybe if you can go to the statement of the conjecture where you uh, uh, mentioned that the chromatic polynomial, the coefficients are, are log concave. Mm, uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, so, so. I, so I can't yeah. hear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so, if you are in a, uh, a situation where where you have, instead of having real numbers w sub k, you have polynomials w sub k in, uh, uh, so polynomials with non-negative uh, uh, 
coefficients and and you want to show that uh, w sub k squared minus wk minus 1 wk plus 1 is a polynomial with no, non negative coefficients uh, so do, do you know what might be uh, some way of uh, going about uh, and and they they could be like so this would be more general than what you have here and and uh, you you can perhaps do with like multivariate polynomials yeah so you mean q q log concave uh, sequences sort of uh, concave yeah concave uh, for example yeah and, th and this uh, this is not covered by our methods so we can only sort of if these were the w case were polynomials we could only look at evaluations of them and not coefficient wise which is sort of a down well no it, it's a something that we can't do but it would be, of course, desirable if one could do it. But this is a good question uh, that I can't answer. Are there any uh, other questions or comments? May I try one? So you said a bunch of negative results. You said that you cannot prove negative uh, correlation except for a factor two and negative associ association in general and things like that. Is it conceivable that the whole construction of the Lorentzian polynomial is good and the only thing that is a bit to be tweaked is the choice of the two points uh, over which you do the interpolation? Or that one is a minor choice that is fixed anyhow. So, into, uh, so what, what do you mean by choosing the points for interpolation? I don't. You were using a, a final lemma, telling that once you have a, a Lorentzian polynomial, you mm -hmm. had the convexity coming from uh, the polynomial in S times 0.1 plus okay. T times oh. 0.2. Okay, so you mean that we could. There is some arbitrariety on the choice of P1 and P2. Maybe exploring other choices gives other stuff. Or maybe I'm missing the thing. So, so, so in general, for uh, for Lorentzian polynomials, uh, we have so so this uh, inequality. Where it is? Yeah. So this inequality here holds actually for any Lorentzian polynomial. So we can think of this as the, deriv the derivative with respect to i and then to j. So the, the, the corresponding holds that if f is Lorentzian, then, well, di dj f times, times f is less than or equal to 2 times di f times dj f in the positive orthant or, or in, in the cone. So this is always true, but it's sharp too. So, 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 so we can find Lorentzian polynomials where this is well, where this holds. Well, the two, the two is actually not the correct constant, but it's it's a depends on. So now maybe I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's. And I think D. Okay. So let me, it's two times. Uh, d over d minus one. So this is sharp, unfortunately. So so one cannot sort of deduce this by the by means of Lorentzian polynomials. At least not by just looking at these these inequalities. I guess you mean two d minus one over g or d over d minus one. Otherwise, oh d minus one over yeah sorry. The correct one. <clears throat> I see. But it could be that for certain, you know, subclasses of Lorentzian polynomials, we can. There, yeah. There, there is maybe there. There is this inequality with, with coefficient equal to one. So this, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the point is, if we add this uh, requirement with coefficient one to the definition, would we have a space which is good for what concerns closure under products and sum and whatever? Yes, exactly. 
Yes, that's exactly the problem. So one wants to find some property where we have this constant equal to one, but when this property is closed under under property, and there is such a property, namely stable polynomials. But it turns out that stable polynomials is too sharp, is too strong. So we want something in between stable polynomials and Lorentzian polynomials. Yep. It's a good Are there any more questions? So uh, thank you again. Thank you.